It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Today, answering your questions on the Happy Families Podcast about a husband who refuses to pull his weight and leaves the house a mess, leaves everything for his wife to do. What is going on there? As well as that, a 12-year-old who is dealing with massive anxiety, can't go to sleep at night, has no friends, and is causing so much stress and challenge in the home. Hello, my name is Dr. Justin Coulson. Welcome. Welcome to the Happy Families Podcast. So good to have you here. Uh, If you would like to know about how to make your family happier, if you'd like to know about how to improve your well-being, if you'd like to know about how to make your relationships stronger, in fact, if you'd like to ask me anything at all, just submit your questions with the super simple system at happyfamilies.com.au. All you have to do is go to the homepage, click the record button at the podcast section and start talking. That is literally it. Let's fire this one up. The first question comes from somebody who is anonymous and this is what they've asked. Hey, Justin and Kylie. Incredibly frustrated right now. I can't be everything to everyone. My husband acts like he doesn't expect anything of me, but then when he needs to step up, he just can't. I honestly think it's feigned incompetence. I got the house prepared for the school holidays so that it was easy to have time with the kids instead of spending all my time cleaning and chasing my tail. I also managed to keep it clean the entire first week of the holidays, despite having play dates and many cooking sessions and messy play games with my kids. On the weekend, I picked up a shift and when I got home at 10 p.m. from said shift, the house was a bomb. I am just so angry that he didn't take half an hour to get everything in order so that I wouldn't have to come home to a pigsty. What am I meant to do with a husband who is more of a child than my kids? We're also trying to navigate the NDIS maze. Thanks so much. Okay, this one's a tough one. I want to give your husband the benefit of the doubt. I want to suggest that there are other ways to do parenting other than the way that you want it to be done. I really think that sometimes perspective taking can be helpful. And it sounds like you're just so stressed out, both of you, that there are any number of explanations for what could be going on. Therefore, what I'm about to say, you need to really, I guess, take with a grain of salt if there's any compassion or empathy or any other way of seeing things. Based on the information you've given me, though, Let's call a spade a spade. If your husband is feigning incompetence, that's a load of garbage. He's not helpless. He's choosing not to help. He is an adult. He's capable and he's leaving you overwhelmed and he's leaving you resentful. You're trying to juggle work, the kids, a spotless house, navigating the NDIS maze. And it sounds to me like he's coasting. That's not a partnership. It's a one-woman show with a very reluctant audience member. So here's my advice, minus any ultimatums or anything like that, because I don't think that's what we need here. And I want to add one more time, the caveat, we might have this all wrong. Maybe he's choosing to play with the kids rather than tidy the house because that's what he values and that's where he thinks he can add the most value. Maybe he's choosing to bust himself all day at work and when he comes home, he is absolutely cooked and has nothing left. I don't like what I'm hearing. I'm not convinced that that's what's going on, but I do want to give him the benefit of the doubt if we can. If I'm wrong, if you're right, three things. Number one, don't be a martyr. You're not Wonder Woman. You are a human being, and human beings need help. They need sleep. They need support. They need a community and a village, and they need a partner who is on their team. So I would stop trying to do it all and move into conversations where you can talk with him about what he's doing to make the contribution that's necessary to keep things moving and to take the load off you. That might involve, number two, having what some people might call a come to Jesus meeting where you sit down and you lay it all out, the exhaustion and maybe even the resentment and the unfairness and and be honest about it, but don't be accusatory. Okay. This isn't about pointing the finger and saying, you're not pulling your weight. You're not doing what you should be doing. Rather, it's about saying, I'm doing all of these things and it's not sustainable and I need your help. And I know you're helping in a variety of ways that you think really do help, but they're not the things that I need the most. That's what I mean there. Okay. This has got to be a very careful conversation, not a blame game or it will blow up. The third thing that I would recommend that you do here, my anonymous friend, is set some really clear expectations around what you're looking for. And and probably, I want to say consequences, but that's not the right word. Here's how I'd say it. Don't just vent. Offer solutions. So it might be that you say, this is what I'm struggling with. There's the resentment. There's the unfairness. There's the exhaustion. And I've put this list together of things that I think we can work on together. Or here's this shared calendar. Or here's a chore chart. 
whatever it takes to get him involved. And I guess that's the bit where if he doesn't follow through, if he's unwilling, well, I guess, first of all, if he's unwilling, but he's got really good reasons for being unwilling, then that means that you have that conversation and work it out from there. If he's able to do stuff but just doesn't, that's the bit where you say, all right, well, if if you if you're not willing to step up, I'm going to step out. And when I come back, I need these things done. Uh, have a have a me day or take the kids out or I, I don't know, what, whatever it is that you need to do so that you can make it clear to him that there's an expectation that's not being satisfied. Now, as for the NDIS, you've indicated that that's a, 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 this, it's a bureaucratic mess. I would just say don't let it defeat you. You're fighting for your daughter. And, and to me, that's the most important battle of all. So keep pushing, keep advocating. Keep being that fierce mama who's protecting her cub and help her to get the support that she needs. Bottom line here, you deserve a partner, not a project. If you are doing all of this work, I think that in some ways, this is a hard thing to say, but based on the scenario that I've been presented with here, some of what's going on with the very best of intentions leads to enabling his laziness. He needs to participate in the family. Family meetings, I've talked about them endlessly on the podcast. I think a couple's meeting is the kind of thing that's going to get this thing moving forward. What's going well? What's not? What can we work on together? Getting on the same page. That's the way that I'd be heading with this. I know it's a sort of a tough love conversation. Good luck. Really tricky one. Let's move on to question number two from Michelle in Victoria. Hi, Justin and Kylie. Recently, my 12-year-old daughter was assessed for autism and ADHD. She has chronic insomnia and sleeps in our bed. She regularly has anxiety attacks before bed. The next day, we are all exhausted. Her worst anxiety is no friends at school. She doesn't want to sleep at night because she says that her mind won't switch off. In her words, she says, it's like eating a rotten banana. You know how terrible it tastes and you know there's nothing that you can do to stop it happening again and again. Please, could you give us your best advice to help? Oh, Michelle, I hear the exhaustion and and I hear the desperation and this is such a hard one. Um, a, a couple of things here. The first thing that I want to highlight is that psychological support from a qualified mental health practitioner is going to be your best bet here. I can only say so much in five or six minutes on the podcast, but what I do want to share with you hopefully will be helpful in a general sense. Specific help from somebody who can dive deep into your circumstances is going to be helpful. Uh, I want to start with the definition of mental health. The way that I look at mental health is this. Mental health is having the tolerance for difficult feelings and being able to respond to those difficult feelings in adaptive and functional ways. And what I'm hearing in your message on the part of your daughter is an undeniable absence of mental health. She is struggling with its opposite, with mental illness, which is a a, a tremendous challenge and you've articulated it so well. Something that you didn't quite clarify for me, though, is you said that your daughter has been assessed for autism and ADHD, but you didn't indicate whether she has been diagnosed with those things. And so I'm a little bit limited in what I can say based on that uncertainty that I have in your message. Let's talk about anxiety because that's something that you were very clear about. Um, Anxiety around bed and anxiety around social challenges. Let's start with the bedtime stuff. Bedtime routine I think is key to your well-being and to your daughter's well-being. In fact, if there was one well-being hack and one parenting hack that I could give you, it's got nothing to do with well-being or parenting. It's just get enough sleep. And clearly that's not happening for you. This is a really, oh, it's just a really hard one. Uh, I'd be talking with a, a GP, a medical practitioner, and having a look at any kind of medical issues that could be promoting this. It does sound like it's primarily psychological, but there are also different kinds of uh, medical support that you can get, medical interventions, pharmaceutical and interventions that can help your daughter to sleep without being heavily pharmaceutical. Like there are natural versions of many pharmaceutical products. And I'd be having a chat about the safest and healthiest options there with a GP or somebody else that you trust with that kind of advice. Getting enough sleep is going to be really, really, really key to you having success here. When I listen to this, I just... I, I, 
parents make such huge sacrifices. We're required. Our children demand it of us that we make these enormous sacrifices. When it comes to sleep, this might be one of those sacrifices. I'd be looking at what kind of a routine works for her? What do we need to do to get her to sleep? And if that means that she sleeps in bed with mom or that dad goes and sleeps in another room or that that you come up with some kind of a solution that may be quite a sacrifice but helps her to get the sleep, in fact, helps everyone to get the sleep that they need, you're going to find that tempers are going to be much, much more in control. You're going to find you've got psychological and cognitive and you're going to have more capacity, more resources to respond to the challenges that you're you're experiencing and that they're, they're significant challenges. Let's move away from the exhaustion and the sleep for a moment and talk about something that's going to sound like it's a little bit off off track, but I think it's really important. I'm curious, when you've got a 12-year-old girl, what, what is it that, that ignites delight in her life? I'd be looking for ways that I could create that in her life. Uh, we've recently, and this is a, this is a personal uh, anecdote that will highlight the kind of thing that I'm describing. As you probably know, because you're a podcast listener, we're homeschooling our two youngest kids. One of them is 14, one of them is 10. And our 14-year-old recently had the opportunity to go and volunteer at a, at a horse, I guess, I guess you'd call it a ranch. I don't know. I mean, does Australia have ranches? At a facility where there are hundreds of horses. She's in love with horses. And because she's homeschooled, she got ahead on her schoolwork. And then she took a week away from schoolwork and went and volunteered at this place. And she shoveled poo and she brushed horses and she saddled them and she put bridles on them. And she got to go on some, uh, some horse rides. I, what do you call that when you jump on the horse with a bunch of people? I can't think of what it is, but she got to go on some horse ride things uh, along the the tracks in the mountains and that kind of thing. And for a week, she stayed at my parents on the New South Wales Central Coast, and they helped her to get to and from while she had this experience. And and it changed her. She became a different person. She was not involved with her screens. She was going to bed early. She was waking up at five o'clock, even though she didn't have to be there until like eight or eight thirty or something like that. It it fundamentally changed her her experience of life. Her social circles have changed. Everything shifted because of what she's done there. And so, my question for you is: What ignites delight in your daughter? And can you prioritize that? Can she be involved in that extracurricular activity? two or three or four days a week? Can she be in a place where there is social safety two or three or four days a week? What can we do to help her to have more experiences of autonomy and competence and relationship with others? Those kinds of experiences will subdue anxiety and also help her, I think, especially if they're physically engaging, help her to sleep better because she's just going to be exhausted. Last of all, the social anxiety. I'm going to recommend all the usual stuff, the sort of things that people talk about, like getting together with friends, helping her to be in safe places with people that she gets along well with, developing relationships with people that she's got an interest in, working with other parents, talking to the teachers, involving other adults that work with her. These are the kinds of things that most people would recommend for this kind of thing. It's a bit of a tricky one, but that's the direction that I'd definitely be pointing you towards there. Ultimately, you want to have a calm household. Tough love isn't going to work. I think validation of emotions, normalization. You know what? A lot of kids struggle with this. You're not going through anything particularly unusual. It is kind of common. It doesn't mean it's not challenging, but it is kind of common. Let's get a predictable routine. Let's work with our mental health provider to get the support that we need and see where we go from there. It's a really tough one. Michelle from Victoria, thank you so much for the question. Good luck. Hard work in front of you. Uh, But I know that if you stay the course and work through these processes, they will make a difference for you. Thanks so much for your questions. Next week, more of your Happy Families questions. You can submit your questions via the super simple system at happyfamilies.com.au. Just scroll down to where the podcasts are, press the record button, start talking. It's really that simple. And I love answering your questions. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rulon from Bridge Media. More information about making your family happier is available at happyfamilies.com.au. 